Welcome back to The Highway with Kyle Shutt. I am so excited about our guests this week. They were one of my favorite bands when I first moved to Austin back in 2000, the Lawrence Arms. I got to see them so, so many times. And today we're going to talk to their drummer, Neil Hennessy. He's been in a bunch of other bands too. We're going to talk about all things punk rock. As always, if you like what you've been hearing on the program, go ahead and smear a bunch of hand sanitizer on, pop on those latex gloves, and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. And if you want to go one step further and help make sure that I keep cooking with gas, you can find us at patreon.com slash the highway. For a few bucks a month, you can get yourself a rad shout out on the program like Zach Rubel or Jordan Epinet. You can get a monthly guitar lesson from me. You can get some sweet Kyle Shut merch. I've got it all. We also got to give a shout out to our amazing sponsors, Heil Sound, because if you like the way I sound, it's because there's a Heil in front of me. I'd shout out more sponsors if we had any, so if anybody wants to get on this train, just call me up. I'm easy to talk to. But right now, I want to talk about Chicago. Let's do it my way. The Highway. Hey, what's going on, Neil? Not too much, Kyle. How are you? I am doing fine. Thanks so much for coming on the program. Uh, Neil Hennessy, everybody, from the Lawrence Arms, but Colossal, you yeah. played in the Smoking Popes for a while, you played in Rise Against for a minute. You, you, you do it all. Uh, <laughs> are, you, uh, are you still out in L.A.? <laughs> I am, yeah. Yeah, I've moved out here in 2015. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I still maintain a lot of my Chicago connections musically and, and stuff, but, uh, yeah, L.A. has got got a, a thing going on out here you know <laughs> it certainly does it's like a it's like a year-round paradise i've heard that uh i've heard downtown is a little bit crazy right now uh with <laughs> like a, yeah after covid with all the the homeless uh kind of i wouldn't call it a crisis i don't know i think all the uh the homeless people heard that finally that the secret's out like la is like paradise you know all year round so <laughs> yeah the weather it can, it can get a bit hot here but yeah generally it's pretty nice all year round that's great. Well, um, dude, thanks so much for coming on again. Uh, just a little backstory for me personally. Um, I grew up in a real small West Texas town with uh, not a whole lot going on there. And um, it was through um, mail order that I found out about most of my music. I'm um, just looking at the back of uh, Fat Records releases and, and things like that. I Down the pipe, yeah. somehow found out about um, the whole Chicago scene uh, through Blue Meanies and Thick Records and then through Asian Man. It just sort of like oh, snowballed nice. into that. So I've been... Um, uh, I was I was a big fan of the Broadways, and then from that, you know, came Lawrence Arms and stuff. And uh, I, I used to when I moved to Austin in two thousand, I would see you guys at least like four times a year. I mean, you <laughs> toured like non fucking stop. Back in those days, I didn't really think about it um, so much, just because that's all I ever wanted to do was just get in a van and say uh, goodbye to the world. But um, yeah, I, I just wanted yeah. to ask you, like, kind of what made you. Um, get into punk rock what, what what made you want to play drums and get in a van and just uh, say goodbye to the world well i would say my brother is the biggest influence just sort of bringing music into the house because growing up i was a little more like a like i would play sports and just kind of be a general like kid you know i wasn't like i wasn't fucking off when i was a kid and then all of a sudden my brother started bringing home records uh you know like black flag fugazi uh dead milkman stuff like that and that was like my, I didn't know what punk was, but that was, you know, I, I was hearing this music and I was like, oh, this is different than like whatever's on the radio, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it had a different sort of thing going on. And I ended up breaking my arm playing Little League Baseball, like at the end of eighth grade. And it sort of shifted my whole outlook. Like I, I thought maybe I'd go into high school and play sports and that would be my thing, but I didn't. I didn't want coaches yelling at me, you know, I, I didn't <laughs> like the authority. I didn't like that sort of, um, I don't know, falling in line to whatever you needed to do with this big group. And, and, um, music was a way that I felt like you could make a scene by yourself with people that you really wanted to be with rather than be a part of something else that's established, you know? So, um, so yeah, I broke my arm. And then that summer, uh, summer of 93, uh, my brother had like, you know, brought home these records, but he was also learning to play guitar and he had a friend that played drums in the neighborhood. So the friend brought a drum set over and we had a drum set and a guitar rig and then eventually a bass rig in the basement 
and I just started kind of fucking around with that uh, that summer and into the into my freshman year, and then eventually met kids. You know, like when you go to high school, there's all the different junior high schools that kind of feed into the bigger high school. And um, I met I met guys that um, just had maybe recently bought a bass guitar or like just took a guitar lesson, and they were like, "Yeah, let's." Do, you know, I, and I told him I had this drum set and this setup in my basement, and uh, we just got together and started to try to make music that was like, kind of like Ween and Dead Kennedys and early back, you know, before Mellow Gold and all that, like kind of like just dirty, weird music. Um, and so that was like, I I was so attracted to that, like after school going into the basement, sitting around with people and just creating our own world. Like it didn't matter. Uh, you know, the school stuff didn't matter or our parents didn't matter, whatever. It was just, let's, let's write a weird song about whatever topic. Um, so that was sort of my first attraction to like playing in bands and, and that kind of thing. But then learning about punk rock was a few years later when I eventually met some people from another school and we, they had already started a band uh, called Baxter, which is uh, Tim from Rise Against. He's the singer of Rise Against. So I'd heard this demo tape of this band from another school and eventually met them and then joined Baxter. And that was when I was like, Oh, this is like the punk scene. Like, cause they were already playing shows and meeting other bands from other neighboring suburbs and things like that. Um, and I was just like, Oh, this is so much more interesting than anything that school could offer me or, you know, and I just sort of kind of, you know, I, I passed my classes, but I kind of stopped doing work. <laughs> If that makes any sense. Dude, I, I have a very similar trajectory where I was like the second that I hit the road playing in like this little ska punk band and would come back to school, I'd be like, none of this matters. <laughs> you know, yeah. There's a whole world out there. Yeah. You start to see like what school really is. Like I get it. Like I, I'm not putting it down at all, but there's certain things you have to follow to get to the next level. And, and then the next level gives you bigger rewards within whatever work, whatever industry, or you know, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I wasn't really into that kind of, um, you know, just, I didn't want to take those steps. And I, I also sort of had like a, like, I remember picking up my brother's, my brother had an Ibanez gem. If you remember those guitars, Dude, they had yeah. like the, the hand grip <laughs> inside mm -hmm. of the guitar. Uh, so he had one of those. And I remember picking up like a, like a metal edge magazine or something like that. And there was a tablature for, I want to say it was like lithium by Nirvana. And I just picked up the guitar and kind of looked at the tab and I kind of just understood it right away. And I, I don't know. It, it, I, I feel like in this world, I want to do things that are that feel good and are rewarding. And that was something that was like instantly I could fall into. That's rad. So. Yeah, I, I love music so much just for that very reason. Um, and uh, it's, uh, just go, keeping keeping on going down that path, you never know where you're going to find yourself. So yeah, how did you uh, how did you find yourself just hopping in vans and and just disappearing? <laughs> yeah so so then like the last half of high school was the band baxter that I was in and we, we would play local shows while we were in high school like maybe we drive up to milwaukee in like a couple of our parents cars or something you know and bar borrow a drum set and that kind of thing and then uh our drummer actually dropped out of high school senior year like the last half of senior year and one time he came to practice with this old like 1975 like powder blue work van it was like an industrial work van yes that he he bought for like 150 bucks from some neighbor of his you know <laughs> <laughs> it was weird like you turn the headlights on by this little stomp thing on the floor whoa you know it was like it was a really bizarre setup anyway um so he brought this van and was like hey like let's let's book some shows and we, we started going out for these you know a little longer of week like we do three shows or we go down to st louis and maybe play some downstate Illinois or Indiana shows. Um, and then, you know, that thing eventually blew up on the road in Gardner, Illinois. <laughs> and uh, that was like, that, that was the first taste of many breakdowns like on tour. Full on it, like on fire or did it just die? Like, a sad um, no, it just, it just, it died on the side of the road. Like it just quit on us and we had oh, to get man. it towed. And then I think at that show, actually our bass player was driving separate. So we just, I don't even know. We didn't have cell phones back then. Maybe right. he was still at home. I, he he ended. Up, maybe he was following us. I don't quite remember because this is like twenty five years ago. But uh, um, he ended up picking us up, and then we went and played the show, and then had to like go and get the equipment out of the van eventually. <laughs> 
but uh but yeah so that was like my first time like having you know being in a van and kind of and it was awesome because we were just like 18 year old kids 17 18 year old kids just fucking off just like no parents like just goofing around like we're going to play a show with some you know other touring band or some touring bands like we weren't really a touring band we're just sort of like getting on the road but it was all so exciting to just get get on the road like that you know yeah, how was um? Cause, Cause you were living in Chicago at the time, right? Yeah, I grew up in Mount Prospect, which is like it borders O'Hare Airport, like mm-hmm. on the north side. So, so I wasn't living in Chicago, but yeah. Well, right around there, yeah. But uh, the scene, yeah. What was it like? Uh, watch, like, what was the scene like before? Kind of like uh, the, the whole just sort of pop punk um, just resurgence. I had a friend that called it the Gilman Gold Rush. Uh, yeah. Happened, you know, like what? What? Uh, just kind of growing up in that scene through the nineties, like what? What was? What was that like watching kind of the rise of pop punk and and or whatever you want to call it? Uh... Well, I think I, I mean if you're referring to like are you referring to more to like the early nineties stuff or or later because like I feel like I Chicago's just always been this like um, I, I, I don't know I always wanted to move there back in. Uh, the, the late 90s early 2000s uh, just because all my favorite bands were from there but it just kind of yeah. made more sense for me to move to austin and stuff so chicago is always just kind of like romanticized in my mind but um it's, i just love asking people from there just kind of like what the musical landscape was like through the early 90s and then like through the rise of uh, punk and like the whole fireside scene and everything yeah i think the thing about chicago was it was very eclectic you had so many different scenes all sort of converging uh, at the same play at the same venues so you'd, you'd have like hardcore grindcore ska punk um like kind of street punk then you'd have pop punk uh, then you have like the sort of you know you go out to the uh the fox valley which is where you get like alkaline trio and smoking popes and slapstick and there's like a whole there's a whole sort of different uh lineage that happens out there than there is like on the south side than there is on the north side on the west side and and so at, at any given day, you go to a show in the 90s and you could see four different styles of bands all in the same bill, but it didn't seem odd. Uh-huh. But then you also got tons of touring bands coming through. So we, we, I think there was a lot of influence coming from the Bay Area scene when they would come through or L.A. bands or New York bands or even just from Nashville or Gainesville, you know, like these places where... You know, Chicago's kind of a crossroads when you get to the, the sort of middle north, uh, you know, part of the country. Austin's kind of the same way, whereas, like, I always loved being a band uh, from here just because if you want to tour the West Coast, you just go out and do it and come back. You want to do the East Coast, go out and do it. Sure. And we used to call it the I-35 tour, where you just follow 35 all the way up to Chicago in Minneapolis and just come right back down. Uh, so I can see yeah. Chicago being, like, the exact same way, just, like, in the uh, on the north end of the country, yeah. For sure. Yeah. So it was really great being from there because we could, you could shoot off basically in any direction and there's a a major city like between four and six hours away. Mm -hmm. So you could kind of like, you know, just kind of do, go north one, one weekend and then go east and then west and south, whatever. Um, But yeah, the the shows were great. I mean, there was a lot of people um, starting like small record labels in Chicago that would just put out their friends seven inches and cassette tapes uh, were huge in the 90s. So that was the first thing I ever put out was a cassette tape. What was it? Um, which, uh, the Baxter uh, album nice. called Troy's Troy's Bucket. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> after the Goonies, you know, when they're yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> riding up Troy's Bucket, you know. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Like it, it was it was pretty interesting. I didn't really, I didn't for necessarily foresee a lot of the successes that came out of Chicago. Like when you look at like Skiba and like rise against and that kind of thing, like that's just next level. Um, it was, it was cool to like, you know, and and I, I feel like I kind of got lucky when I got thrown into like after Baxter and I, you know, Baxter had played the Broadway. So I was a big Broadway fan before ever meeting, uh, Chris and Brendan or any of those guys in Broadway. So broken star that that, I still have that record. One of the best, one of the best. And, um, you know, we, we would play shows with these guys and they're a few years older than me. They're, they're, they're like probably class of 95. I'm class of 97. So back then, like two years is, a, is kind of a substantial amount yeah. when you're like still in high school and these guys are, you know, almost 20. And, uh, so when I met, when I met them and Baxter broke up and Broadway's broke up and then we we're talking about starting a band, I was fortunate to start a band with guys that had already put out records on labels you know from california and they had toured they had had booking agents they they knew all of like the sort of things um that were necessary to kind of to kind of get out or you know tour 
Right. And then, so uh, yeah, that just hitting the ground running. The sword was kind of the same way. Like we had all been sort of in bands before, but uh, the, our, our singer JD, he was uh, significantly older than me at the time. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, I think he was like six years older than me. And uh, mm. so, yeah, just kind of like, um, yeah, having that knowledge when, when, so you can hit the ground running is just like so important for a band. <laughs> so you don't definitely, uh, I out. knew I had, a, there were a lot of bands from that era that, you know, Lawrence Arms came up with that we would play local shows with and they're not playing anymore. And we, you know, we would, we started going on tour and started playing in places cause we had distribution through Asian man. So we uh-huh. could go play in whatever town and there would be a small number of people that would come out, you know, 50, 50 people. And so those, those are the sorts of things like, yeah, like Chicago, Chicago is a great city, but it's the kind of place you kind of need to get out of at a certain point. If you want to keep it going. Man, I had a, a funny thing happen to me because uh, I loved guided to a Chicago and uh, especially ghost stories. Love those records. Um, but mm. and this is back in like the mail order. Wow. Days. Like, the, the internet wasn't necessarily like, uh, a, a a, a huge resource for uh, getting your music out there or anything. And um, so, but I, right. I did poke around on what, you know, message boards were there and this and that. And um, two of my favorite things y'all uh, put out were uh, two of your EPs, the the split with the chinkies, which was kind of easy to find because it was on Asian man. But then also mm-hmm. the, the split you did with evergreen terrace, who eventually went on oh, to be sh- a pretty decent shady band. view. Oh, shady. Sh- view terrace. Oh, I'm sorry. Never yeah. mind. I'm so sorry. Sorry. Uh, shady but there view is terrace. an evergreen terrace. There is. That there is. Band, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Mm-hmm. Got got my wires crossed there, but yeah, Shady View Terrace, um, and it was like, I think they put it out or something, right? I don't know how I found it, but eventually I had to contact yeah. them and like get it in the mail. And then I remember going to see you guys at uh, at Inside Emos. This would have been like mm-hmm. 2001 or something like that, and uh, I, th- I think I had it like in my bag or something like that. And uh, it had a song on there called A Toast, and you were I remember talking to you guys and like anything you want to hear. I was like, Will you play a toast? I, I got your new CD, and you're like, How do you have that? Like we don't even have that. Like what? <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's like back in those days. Uh, yeah, it was like hard to hard to get stuff if you didn't have distribution. Yeah, and that, that was I think Castaway Records, which was just like a friend of the Shady View Terrace guys who uh-huh. lived in Jersey. Those guys are from New Jersey, and uh, yeah, I, I guess they maybe just approached us and we decided to do it. I don't remember how that actually like worked out, but um, <laughs> I do know that Mike Park eventually I think repressed it, and then it became a part of the Cocktails and Dreams. Oh, okay recording eventually but um yeah those the the early day i would say the chinky split and uh and the shady view terrace split is where the lawrence arms probably in my mind come together for the first time like i i know you you have an affinity towards the guided tour and ghost stories but those those records were very much like those guys were in college i was working part-time jobs and we didn't know what we were doing we didn't really care we we weren't thinking about touring necessarily at that point you know we were just sort of existing and we made these records and they were cool but we didn't they weren't with recorded with matt allison they were recorded with a different engineer so the sound was very different <laughs> super raw um, i just i loved him man. i love those stories probably a thousand times i love that record uh, oh man and you i mean you you sang a song on that one right i did I yeah cool one because was, all one three of y'all sang that was I, I i really appreciated that yeah and i did some background vocals i do like the really high weird out of pitch vocals in, in the songs. <laughs> <laughs> I remember talking to Chris about that and he was, uh, he was like, Hey, we've been, we've been thinking about re-recording that album, man. What do you think? And I was like, don't do it. <laughs> and it never works out like you think it's going to just leave it. Yeah, definitely. We retracked two of the songs for, um, for something. I think it might've been for cocktails and dreams. Yeah. Um, but, uh, the good yeah. Ones, but y'all, you, I mean, it's, it's in my mind anyway, it seems like once you did start touring, you didn't stop for like ever. I, I, I caught you guys so often back in those days, like uh, on the Plea for Peace tours, or um, I think one of my favorite ones was, uh, I want to say it was like you guys, um, Link 80, uh, Alkaline Trio, and Blue Meanies. Like, that was just yeah, that was the first ridiculous tour, man. Yeah, that was the first Plea for Peace tour. That was actually my first full tour like actually like going on a tour with a bunch of other bands for multiple days we did like almost four weeks we did everything pretty much the whole u.s except for the east coast like we didn't we kind of went south um from detroit and then down to florida and then across but um that was great because it was asian man record so it was every single person on that tour was so great because it was just all asian man records guys and we all love mike park and it was just it, it kind of spoiled me because I'm doing my first tour ever. There's 40 people because it's all these ska bands. So right. it's like eight people in the bands and then their crew. 
And then I think it was Honor System, Lawrence Arms, yeah, MU330. Yeah. Yeah, Honor System, Lawrence Arms, MU330, Link 80, Alkaline Trio, Blue Meanies, uh, Dan Podest played solo, uh-huh. Mike Park played solo, and Chris Murray played solo. So it was all those, <laughs> all those people all traveling around together for a month. Um, and, and, you know, it's like a bigger tour, so we're getting like deli trays and stuff like that. And, and then, uh, and then the next tour happens and it's like, oh, it's not all going to be like uh-huh. all Asian man buds and, de- and deli trays every night. <laughs> like fighting for your six pack. And uh, totally. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Were, there, were there any tour buses on that tour or was it just like so many broken vans? <laughs> there was uh, one tour bus that I think it was like MU and Mike Park and maybe like Chris Murray and like the sound guy and the merch people like, they all rode on the bus and then like yeah there were maybe like four or five other vans i remember our van breaking down a few different times and jerry from uh mb330 and skank and pickle was like fixing our van like (laughs) full-on mechanic style like every few days (laughs) but he loved it it was like camaraderie like we'd all like sit around the van like while he's fixing it like the whole tour like yeah let's fix the van i saw mb330 they probably played more shows than any band ever like I, yeah, I, they have that whole list of all the shows they played in that live like album they put out. Yeah, like their three thousandth <laughs> anniversary or show anniversary live album, ridiculous. I would yeah. say they're the band that the Lawrence Arms has played the most live shows with because we did Plea for Peace and we did the full MU three thirty Big D and the Kids Table tour, which wow. was like six months after that. So I, we probably played like eight, like seventy shows or more with MU three thirty. So you guys were like the uh, like the high octane rock band on the Scott tours. Like, yeah, for sure. <laughs> st- that can work. That, that can definitely work. The sword's definitely <laughs> done the thing where like we're like the the one heavy band on the weird tour, or like the one rock band on the death metal uh, tour. Where yeah, right, it's, yeah, it's good to stick out like that. Uh, definitely, and that that kind of that kind of goes back to like the Chicago scene back in the day. Is like where it was all about anything happening at yeah. any point in time, as long as everyone's cool. Like that was the thing. Like I feel like Chicago was cool, right? <laughs> in that well, way, but yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, uh, things go there. Uh, their their own way uh, and stuff. Uh, what what um, when did you realize that you were uh, going to bounce on Chicago and move out to LA? Oh, uh, that that happened just very quickly. Like uh, there was a tour. A friend of mine uh, had a van at the end of a tour that was going to be in Chicago, empty, that needed to be driven back to LA. And I knew about two months in advance. Like I got the information, and I was like, I've been living in the same apartment in Chicago for like fourteen years. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, I, I was just do. I had done all the things that I feel like I could do in Chicago at that point. I was like, why don't I just pack my bedroom up, put it in this van, and then move out to LA for just gas money? So I moved to LA for like four hundred bucks or you know three hundred fifty bucks. I got like one hotel room in Tucumcari, New Mexico, and <laughs> that was that was my yeah. That was like the the, the drive out in two days, and then Damn. I stayed uh, on a friend's couch for for a little while and tried to figure it out, but I didn't really tell anyone. I, I told my parents and obviously my bandmates and stuff, but it's, it wasn't like I was like making some huge thing. It was a huge decision in my mind. I was like, yeah, I can still tour and do what I do from anywhere. Totally. Especially at that point. Cause the Lawrence arms, you know, we haven't really rehearsed in probably 10 years. Like we, we rehearsed for an album. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know? I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. It's like, like <laughs> my practice anymore. Like, so we used to yeah, do that like three days a week you know, for like seven years probably. And then after a while, like, hey, do we really need to practice anymore? Yeah. <laughs> yeah just rehearse for tour. Um, totally. But, so, so yeah. it just, it was, it was easy for me to sort of like rationalize just moving. And I just wanted to change. I was, I was in my middle upper thirties at the time. And I was like, all right, like maybe I'll just move to LA and kind of turn 40 out there and see what happens. And if it sucks, I'll, I can always either come back to Chicago or, and it, it, it taught me also that moving is easy. Like it's, it, it, I, I know that like financially and like, it can be hard for, to move in general, but like, as far as like the anxiety behind moving and, and, and getting to a new place and, and, you know, I've been on tour all the time, but like actually waking up in a new place every day is yeah. different. Um, but it, it made me realize how how easy it is for me to just pick up and go, even where I live. That's so, yeah. 
I, I love touring too because like it, it, it made like you said you, you went from Chicago to LA in two days like that doesn't really like sound that daunting to me I mean it is you know a crazy drive but like it's, uh, to, so, to some people that don't tour ever or drive like especially in Texas where I live it's like you know uh, my hometown is like five hours away and I'll just drive there without stopping once and people are like five hours oh my god I was like that's what I do every day like you know I've been driving for like yeah. 20 years right <laughs> it's just totally crazy. it's like when you go to England and they talk about like oh, a yeah. two hour drive and uh-huh. they're like what a two hour drive you're like uh. like that's not yeah, even you're... enough time to take a nap you know like <laughs> <laughs> totally uh, what was the uh, touring Europe like for you guys uh, well, it's, it's varied over the years. The first time we went, we were on Asian man. So that was like fall of, or fall into winter of 2000. Uh-huh. And our booking agent was from England, but he was booking the continent shows too. So back then it was, you know, a little more, a little unsure, like what was going to happen when we got to certain places. Um, I remember the first so we flew into London, we played a show in like Nottingham and then we had like three days off. Okay. And then the next show was in Slovenia, Ljubljana, Whoa. which is like, we're, we're staying in Newcastle upon Tyne, which is the Newcastle up North. And, um, we, so we had to drive like, you know, five hours through England, cross the ferry, and then like a 22 hour drive across Europe, the con- the continent to like the first show on the continent <laughs> okay that's absolutely asinine <laughs> it's bonkers and then we and then we kind of like tour back up through you know switzerland into france into germany and it's just like you know the shows are just like who know who knows what to expect uh-huh. uh, it was great it was awesome i mean we we had a great time our driver was definitely bonkers like at the end of the tour we didn't have enough money to pay him and he took out a switchblade and was like threatening us whoa yeah, it was, it was pretty gnarly. Um, we had to like, <laughs> we had to like seriously get some money wired to us and pay him off. Holy and shit. it was, it was, su- it was not great. Um, but the other guy, we had two drivers, and the other driver was great. We still talk to him to this day. But um, <laughs> but yeah, the the first time was a little rough, and then and then we signed to Fat Records uh, the next year in two thousand one. And then the next time we went to Europe, which is 02, it was, you know, we were flying into Berlin. There's a Fat Records office. Um, there's people that just sort of are around that are a part of the scene. So when you go to shows, there's like, oh, I'm, you know, I do the street team or I, mm-hmm. you know, I do this sort of stuff. And that just kind of shifted and the show has got a little better. Um, and that happened everywhere, too. Just in when we signed to Fat Records, like all the tours we would get would would go from just sort of finding some friends that we wanted to tour with to like, Oh, you're going to go on tour with no effects or no use for a name or D four hot water music. Like all the cool bands yeah. started kind of like opening up to us <laughs> That's awesome. uh, when, when you get to that point. Yeah. So in Europe was the same way, like, like the, the shows and the promotion or the, I should say the promoters and the places we would play, um, we would just get a little, a little better, better sound system. Um, the crowds were just getting a little more solid and, um, yeah, like we've, I think we've toured Europe probably like seven or eight times, and then we've done some stuff where we've gone to UK just by by itself. Yeah. And um, it's all, yeah, it's like we, I feel like we did a really good stretch for about ten years, and then we didn't go for a while, and then we went back, and it was like, oh, did it disappear? Like it's hard to tell in in, in Europe if people remember you or not. Mm-hmm. At least for for our scene, you know, for what we're doing. Yeah, when uh, when I uh, met y'all in, in the capacity of uh, being peers, I suppose it was uh, in Australia doing the Soundwave tour. That's right. Uh, that like That's giant, right. ginormo uh, festival run. Uh, playing shows like that is crazy because like you just never like sometimes you're like up against like Slayer and you're like oh great yeah you know or I don't know some days it just works out you know and you have a great show but uh yeah was, <laughs> did you do uh did you do mini festival tours like that or is that w- kind of like one of those like vacation no where you just like agree to it and just have fun. <laughs> Yeah, we just got offered that tour, and we just decided to do it. I mean, that was a gnarly. It was insane. It was like Metallica, Anthrax, Slayer on the on the heavy side, and then it was like Offspring, Blink One Eighty Two, Paramore, Some Forty One, maybe like that kind of thing on the other side. I I remember um, uh, Mike Herrera. Uh, was playing bass for the Ataris, and they did like a combo Ataris MXPX set. It was crazy. Oh wow! (laughs) Yeah, that's great. And I think yeah, I, um, I, I remember going to see Melancholin because I was like, oh, I never got to see them back in the day. I'll go check it out. And like, I went and there's like 30,000 kids all singing along. Uh, I was just like, what great. the hell? I, I did not expect that. Yeah. 
Yeah, that tour was awesome because it was like you fly, you know, in Australia, you have to fly pretty much to all the different uh -huh. cities, but they would, we would, I, I'm assuming you guys did this too, because we did like, you, you play a club show and then you also yeah. play a, like a, a proper thing about flying around in Australia to me was that like, you know, they never had like a nine 11 or like some huge, crazy terrorist disaster, uh, not going right. again yet. Um, but, um, so yeah, you like, you don't have to take your shoes off. I didn't have to take my belt off to get on the plane. I walked on the plane with an open bottle of whiskey, you know, the, the <laughs> captain's just like pointing at me like, ha ha ha, look at this kid, you know, yeah. and, uh, just, uh, it's, uh, I love playing over there just because it's, it's just uh, it's so lighthearted. People that just have such good attitudes. I fucking love Australia. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a party country slash continent. <laughs> <laughs> also playing Perth was rad. Cause it's like the, it's literally like the most removed city I think in, in the world, isn't it? I think it's like the first yeah. from anything else. So yeah, when you're out there, it's like literally the edge of the world, staring at the Indian ocean, just to, yeah. because I felt really free. Um, that's uh, if, if you're in Perth and you get on a train, you can go to another a city a little bit further out into the coast called Fremantle, uh, which is where Bon Scott is buried or where his little uh, memorial, memorial uh, yeah. thing is. So yeah, we, we had a lot of fun going out there and uh, yeah, finding his uh, final resting place and uh, stuff. Yeah. So a lot of history out there, a lot of just um, great music too. Definitely. Yeah, we, we've toured over there a few different times and uh, I can't wait to get back. I know it keeps, uh, well, we, uh, on the tour that I'm supposed to be doing, uh, in September, it was supposed to be with Wolf Mother and, uh, mm. yeah, they had to drop off the whole tour. Cause I guess the country's like on lockdown again. I was like, Oh my God, uh, I'm trying to uh, shit. about it. Yeah. It's just like, ugh. yeah, I mean, LA just, uh, we put our mask mandate back on yeah. yesterday uh -huh. or something. So the Delta variants is flying around, uh -huh. Oosh. but Oosh. I don't know what to do. Yeah. It's like, people are like. You know, I'll see you guys in September. I was like, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. Yeah, I hope so too. Because <laughs> this tour has been delayed like 16 yeah. times, I think. Did you have any tour dates that mm -hmm. got postponed or anything like that? Or did you find yourself like in a, a kind of a lull already? Well, so Lawrence Arms had made an album in January of 2020. We went to uh, Sonic Ranch in Tornillo, Texas. Nice. Like, yeah, it was such a great studio. If anyone has the means to get out there, I recommend it. Um, did they, but I, we, did yeah. they cook for you and everything too? Did they have like the whole operation? Oh yeah! Oh man! Um, amazing! Awesome. And we were the only band there because it was the middle of January. So like, we had the run, we could go to any one of the studios and get whatever drum set or guitar or even like speakers, like monitors, anything we wanted to do, we could go and like we could grab and, and use. Um, so we had we had uh, spent about two weeks out there in late January, early February, and that was when you know we're here that's when the news is all right. kind of coming in about it so i remember talking to chris about it like oh this we'll see how this virus shakes out from wuhan and um and then drove home got home like middle february and then like within a month lockdown happened so yeah. we were we were just about to start booking the tour for the the release which would have been i guess it came out in july so it's probably about a year ago the record came out yeah <laughs> and um we we were probably gonna have like we're not a huge touring act at this point we probably do like you know 40 to 50 shows in a in the you know seven to 12 months after the record comes out yeah. we're not gonna be we're not we're not like we used to be back in the early 2000s 250 um, shows a year yeah yeah it's it's different now with families and just different different things we all have to do um but we still love it and we still like to do it when we can um when it makes sense for everyone so luckily we didn't have to scrap a bunch of stuff and we didn't put our booking agent through a bunch of work that didn't need to happen but um excuse me uh but yeah like um we're trying to figure out now exactly how we want to you know come back to it at this point yeah man that's wild. Right. Um, uh, what was it like whenever, uh, cause I know you just, it, you've known the rise against guys for a long time, but, uh, what, um, uh, was it like, uh, switching from guitar being on tour versus uh, being the drummer? I didn't know if that was the only time you had ever, uh, done that or yeah, if that was just like, what that was like, just not having to fuck with drums every day. <laughs> Yeah, it was great. I mean, I didn't even have to fuck with a guitar. I just had to put the guitar on and, <laughs> and hit it. You know? uh, it was it was awesome. You know, I mean, Tim and I, we've been friends since we were, you know, 15, 16 years old. And we kind of learned about songwriting and being in bands together. So when he, he broke his wrist and he just needed a fill-in guitar player, and I played guitar in my high school band. I didn't play drums in Baxter. Oh, so, okay. so Tim and I, were always, we always 
played guitar for hours when we were younger and then he broke his hand and he just hit me up and he's like hey you know like we have a couple fill-in guys that we're thinking about getting but i don't really know any of them and they were in like kind of established bands like my cam my chemical romance and a uh-huh. uh, guy from Foo Fight, like chris shiflett stuff like that and and he's like but i would have to like invite him out to like where I live and they put them up in a hotel and like, I don't really know them that well. And they have to like come over to my basement and it's like, I kind of want to just hang out with you. Like, why don't you just come over and learn these guitar parts and let's go on tour together. And I was like, all right, yeah, that sounds great. So I just like went over to his house and, and we would go through the songs and I already, I knew I already, I listened to rise against just cause I'm, you know, I am curious about what my buds are up to. So I kind of knew the songs already. And then it was more about him showing me the real, like what he's really playing. <laughs> Um, also, you got and then Zach in there too, who's a great guitar player in his own right. Oh, he's awesome! Yeah, and he's doing a little more of like the leady stuff. Uh-huh. So, I, I it, for me, it was really just about power chords and doing like little little line, you know, like little linear guitar parts. But it was nothing crazy, so I didn't have to learn any like insane solos and just that like kind a of shit. Pure vacation tour. It was awesome. Yeah, it was because um, <laughs> it was it was one show in. Uh, Quebec City, one show in Dallas, and then like a two week European tour. And in Europe, I mean, there's small there's small shows in Europe are five thousand, and we were doing these we were doing these shows for like ten to fifteen thousand people, three band bill. It was um, I can't remember Thomas from Strike Anywhere's newer band. I can't remember their name. Uh, so it was them opening, refused. Rise Against, oh three band bill, God, dude, fifteen thousand, you know, twelve thousand tickets in Germ in Germany specifically. There's three nights in a row where it was like ten to twelve thousand tickets. Good lord, just wild, yeah. And like I remember Tim, like before we went on one of the big shows, he's like, "Just so you know, it's a whole other beast out there when you get to this size show." And I was like, "All right." And I got up there and I'm playing. And I'm like, "Yeah, you like you feel you feel the the stage differently. You feel yeah. the the way things are reverberating differently. Uh-huh. The way the crowd." is like just the way that they're like looking up at you or <laughs> like such a mind fuck. It, it really is, man. Were you on uh, in-ears or were, did you just have monitors? Yeah, I had in-ears. I, I had to actually get them molded for that yeah. specifically. Yeah, I was going to say like it's, um, uh, it's, it's totally different because I, I, I don't really like using in-ears. So whenever you play a show that big and you're trying to use monitors, like you... <laughs> You learn real quick that, like, if you take, like, uh, two steps in any direction, like, you cannot hear shit anymore. <laughs> you know? Yeah, totally. You need to be right in front of the uh-huh, speaker. Yeah. That or you just, like, all you can hear sometimes is, like, the um, the snare drum, like, reflecting off the back of the room, like, you know, and you totally. it, like, you know, three seconds later, and it'll totally fuck up your time. Yeah. <laughs> God. I haven't played a show that big in a long time, but, uh, yeah, I, I do remember it very well. Um that, that's sick. Well, on the flip side of that, though, um, what was it like uh, hooking up with the Smoking Popes? Because, like, I I grew up loving that band, and uh, I kind of I, – I thought they had broken up for a while. So when I heard that you had joined, it was kind of like right when they had gotten back together. I think it was like 06, 07, something. Yeah. Like I can't remember exactly when it was, but um, I was so stoked when they got back together, and then I heard you were playing with them. I was like, no fucking way. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, that was great because I, I loved the Popes when I was in high school, and – I never thought I would ever have a chance to be in the band because they broke up and then, you know, eventually they they got back together in like November of 2005. And I was playing, uh, I was playing second drums in a band called Colossal. You had mentioned earlier and Eli caterer from the Popes was the bass player from Colossal. So when they were getting back together the first time he wanted to ask me, but it was just like I was doing Lawrence Arms and things were kind of busy and they, they got Rob Kellenberger from Slapstick and uh, Tuesday. Nice. So he played drums on the reunion show, but then he couldn't tour. So then they got Ryan Chavez, who's from Houston. If you, I don't know if you know Ryan Chavez. I, I know him very well. Yeah. So he played drums for two years. And, uh, and then when he bounced, they just, they just hit me up and they're like, hey, do you want to do, do this? So that would have been like... Um, I guess it would have been like early 2008 because yeah, i joined yeah that was when i saw it because uh at the sort of, we were just so busy during 2005 2006 like those are the early years of me just being gone all the time and there's so many shows that i missed uh, yeah yeah but that was great because it, it, it upped my musicianship i was all of a sudden playing in a band with three brothers who had very very good timing and very uh great proficiency like when josh is going into a guitar solo 
you better believe he's going to do it right and he's going to do it in time and if my <laughs> drums aren't if my drums aren't doing it it's going to fall apart so like lawrence arms was a little more like i was the freight train barreling through and chris and brendan kind of hang on uh-huh. you know and then all of a sudden i had to learn my place a little bit in smoking pope so it kind of taught me to listen and to understand more what was going on live while we were playing um and also that that just sort of it just bumped up like when i would tell certain people that i played in the smoking popes it was like i saw like a reaction that was different than if i said i was in the lawrence arms <laughs> you know like the smoking popes w- maybe weren't uh, bigger but in certain areas they had more cachet or whatever you want to call it uh-huh. um but yeah like so in the summer of 2008 we ended up doing a tour and we came out to la and you know morrissey's second favorite band is uh smoking popes yep so he ended up coming out to one of our shows and coming back, you know, hanging out backstage after the set for, for an hour or two and just kind of hanging. I, got, I talked to him a little bit, but very, very late. He just wanted to hang out with Josh and yeah. cause he's, in, he's infatuated with the caterer brothers and, and the whole thing. That's so crazy. Um, I mean, I get it, but yeah, that's still, that's wild. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. So, so a few years after that, um, their drummer quit for, for Morrissey's band. And they all sort of threw different names in the hat to see who who uh, they wanted to have come try out. And Morrissey put my name in the hat. Dang. So like, yeah, like he he kind of requested me to come and, and try out. And you know, I I know of Morrissey's music. I've never studied it. I mean, I didn't know how many verses, choruses, whatever right. bridge yeah. work. Um, so I got the I got the email on like a Friday to, to fly to LA on Monday to try out Tuesday morning at like 10 a.m. Oh my god! And I'm I'm in the middle of recording a Sundowner album, so I didn't really have time to like go and really like play the songs. But I just studied these three songs they sent me, and um, just like really got I had to, I had to use in ears. I didn't have molded in ears, but I had uh-huh. uh, just like the ones you buy from you know Walmart or Target or whatever. And um, had to had to play along to, with a click track that had like I had to play a gong. I had to play like all these concert <laughs> bass drums with like mallets and shit. I'm like, what the fuck? Wow. So I don't like like getting to join the Popes and then have Morrissey sort of be like, oh, I really like what you did with the Popes. Come try out for my band. And eventually, the the uh, the drummer from Gnarls Barkley is the guy that uh-huh. Morrissey went with. Like I didn't get the gig. But also, if I had gotten the gig. I couldn't have done any of the bands I was currently playing with. Yeah. I would have had to, I would have had to like put on hold Lawrence arms, smoking popes. I was playing a band called treasure fleet, um, colossal, like anything I could, I just couldn't do it. It was like, you're there for Morrissey. Uh And so like, I get it. Like I'm flattered that he wanted me to come and try out and everything, but I'm super glad I did not get the gig. For, for, uh, but that's like a val- it's more reasons than valid- one at this point, right? <laughs> What's that? Is it for more reasons than one at this point? <laughs> oh, most definitely. That's before any of the weirdness that I, I mean. Maybe there was weirdness out there, but I didn't know about it yet. Yeah. You know. Um, but just to having that validation at that point in my career, I'm like you know 30 and and getting getting a little bit of like a head nod from someone who's in you know, from the Smiths and from yeah. this past this past thing being like oh i like what you're doing what it just felt it felt validating i'm like yes you should continue with this with this path you know i love stories like that man exactly like you you never know where you're gonna find yourself if you just totally keep on going yeah dude neil thanks so much for like sitting down on the program i I really appreciate it i've been a a fan for a long long time and uh, i just i love hearing these stories uh thanks so much whenever um i have a a musical guest on i I ask if if there's any uh, songs they'd like to play Uh, do you want to play a track off the the lawrence arms record you did at the sonic ranch or is there anything else you'd want to play um yeah i mean i guess you could i like dead man's coat from uh skeleton coast lawrence arms let's do it oh yeah yeah thanks for having me kyle it was great talking i I hope to see you uh, soon out on the road somewhere
Thanks so much for tuning into the highway this week. A big shout out to Reverend Guitars, Railhammer Pickups, and Earthquaker Devices. If you liked what you heard, you can follow where you can follow, subscribe where you can subscribe, and if you want to go one step further, you can support us on Patreon at The Highway with Kyle Shutt. For a few bucks a month, you can help us keep this party going, get early access to next week's episode, and even get yourself a shout out. <laughs>